Virginia has ceased publishing. Uh, Tennessee has diminished the number that they do. South Carolina has gone to a monthly publication instead of a newspaper. And Georgia Baptists are ceasing publication at the end of this year. And the Christian Index of Georgia Baptists is one of the oldest, uh, if not the oldest, uh, Baptist state paper. And so there are a lot of challenges in the print. But personally, I believe that there is a vital market, so to speak, for the print, that there are a lot of people who want it. Uh, there's a huge market for it. And uh, in fact, we know for a fact that in North Carolina Baptist life, between 30 and 50 percent of North Carolina Baptists prefer the print medium. <clears throat> I dare say, if McDonald's said, well, only 30 to 50 percent want a hamburger, let's shut down. Let's, let's close down McDonald's. Well, that would be ridiculous. And uh, we, we just have a lot of people who want that print. But let me quickly say that we have the website, brnow.org is one of the top websites. Uh, in fact, we're always in the top three websites for Baptist newspapers in the world. That's not our ranking. That's an independent ranking. This week, we're number two. And uh, they just sort of shift. But there are three newspapers that really are in the top market, and, and your newspaper and your website is one of those. What that translates into is about 20,000 to 35 or 40,000 a day. This, this month, we've had... Uh, that range, basically, between 20 and about 40,000 a day come to the website. So a lot of people traffic that website. There's an app, the BR app, but I would like to apologize and say to you, if you try to download that app or if it's not working, <clears throat> we have a problem in that uh, Apple and Google Play are both playing with our app, and uh, they've got it down right now. We can't figure out what's going on. It's a little frustrating, but... Uh, the BR Weekly is, an, is a weekly e-newsletter. It's another format we have that we send to you every Wednesday morning at 6.30 in the morning. A lot of you are already on that 6.30 Wednesday morning mailing list. How many of you do get that, BR Weekly? Good, good number, but the rest of you need to sign up. It's free, and you can always unsubscribe, and we don't sell your email addresses or share them with anybody. So there's a, a clipboard and a sign-up sheet at a table out this way, but you can go online at any time and sign up free for the BR Weekly, and you'll get that news. Now, what that is is every Wednesday morning, it's our way of saying, hey, here's some big items that you want to know about. You ought to know about, and you'll want to know about these things this week. And some of them will be of interest to you, and some of them may not, but you can scan the list and say, hey, I'd like to know more about that one and read it. And so we're here to get you that information and uh, we're trying to do that in so many different ways, and we hope that it services your need as your pastor leads you, that we supplement that and stand with him in providing you day by day throughout the week the information you need to stand strong and to stand firm as a believer, a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I want to share with you some things today uh, about um, newspapers. Are you familiar with the great Christian newspaper, the New York Times? <laughs> well, it was. The Times founder, Henry Raymond, was a Bible-believing Presbyterian. And in the, 19, I mean the 1870s, you'll see on the screen that the Times passionately opposed abortion. They also opposed uh, infant murder, calling it infant murder. And uh, they said that the, the practice is rank and smells to heaven. One abortionist uh, was exposed through that, and uh, he received a seven-year prison sentence because the New York Times published the truth about it. <clears throat> but the Times was not alone in all of this. Between 1825... In 1845, over 100 cities and towns across America had explicitly Christian newspapers, including Nathaniel Willis's The Boston Recorder. Today, the Boston paper is still publishing, but uh, not quite with the same context. It's interesting that uh, during that period, New York City boasted 52 magazines and newspapers that called themselves Christian. Now, you understand, I'm not talking about a Baptist publication or a Presbyterian publication or any other denomination. I am talking about 
the Atlanta paper, the Boston paper, the Richmond paper, the Raleigh paper, the Charlotte paper, the big cities' papers were, for the most part, distinctly Christian in their commitment, in their foundation, in those who started the papers. Has it ever occurred to you who starts things in this country? Who starts papers? Who starts hospitals? Who starts orphanages? Who starts prison ministries? You'll not find a leftist liberal among them. Who started colleges like Harvard and other great universities? You won't find a leftist among them, those who started. It's people like us that have a passion for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the truth that he stands for, for the truth that he is, and that his, his word stands for and teaches us. This is who starts these kinds of things. But one of the uniqueness of, uh, unique things about the liberal worldview is that it's, it's like there's, there's a, a friend of mine, he, maybe I just won't mention his name, but he's a, one of the great minds of the century in my mind. <clears throat> he said to me one day, liberalism is basically a parasite. And I said, doctor, what do you mean by that? He said, well, it takes what we start that has Christian foundation and take it over and transform it into a liberal humanistic worldview and he said go do the homework name one institution uh, that hasn't gone that way and it will be unique and there are a few that have not gone that direction uh, like Moody Bible College has stood firm through the years and a few others of some some orphanages and hospitals our own uh, Baptist Children's Homes in North Carolina has stood firm and it's good to see that. But for the most part, you'll find probably 90, 95% of institutions like that and like newspapers just get taken over and going in a whole different direction. I might say that what I'm sharing with you, I'm not plagiarizing, but a friend of mine actually put this together. He wrote a book 25 years ago. His name's Warren Cold Smith. Warren lives in the Charlotte area. He's a uh, he's a vice president, one of the senior editors at World Magazine. And uh, he and uh, the senior editor, Marvin Olasky, wrote a book about 25 years ago, and it was called The Prodigal Press. And in that book, 25 years ago, talked about the press straying from their foundations of what we're talking about right here. Interestingly enough, um, I was with Warren Cole Smith a few uh, months ago, and, and he gave me a copy of his most recent revised edition they have updated after it's they call it a 25 year revision obviously and uh, it's revised and updated and you can get that Amazon or anywhere the prodigal press and and in that book he details a lot of this kind of stuff that I'm sharing with you so I'm giving you recognition that this is where you can uh, find this and uh, Warren's a sharp guy and got a lot of uh, great things going but you'll find of course and you're looking at these newspapers now that they are Christian no more. Uh, the New York Times uh, editorializes regularly in favor of same-sex marriage and abortion. Recently, Times columnist Thomas Friedman equated the Tea Party to the terrorist group Hezbollah. Uh, fellow Times columnist uh, did, this, did him one better. He said that the Tea Party uh, Republicans have waged jihad on the American people. So this, this is what you've got in most newspapers today. Jill Abramson has been the senior editor of the New York Times. Of course, she got fired last year, in case you don't know that. But uh, in 2011, she gave a very revealing quote. This is a very brilliant Harvard graduate, by the way. Her husband's a Harvard graduate, very brilliant people. Um, but you need to see what people believe who publish newspapers. And you've probably already read it, but she said, and I'm going to read it out loud, in my house, the times substituted for religion. It was absolute truth. Whoa. That's strong stuff. But when you get into believing that where you're drifting in your life, you have somehow confirmed a new religion and you've made one up and you like what you believe and you've customized, you've basically you've pulled together a designer God. You've designed God to be what you want him to be. <clears throat> and uh, then you say that is religion 
and what you publish is all of a sudden absolute truth, uh, you know, th there's a problem with this because we know that absolute truth is only found in the Word of God, uh, not in things that make up as we go along through this life, that we just don't, we can't make up the rules as we go along. Also, about 25 years ago, there was a book published in the late uh, 1990s called The Media Elite, America's New Power Brokers. This was not done by a Christian writer. Um, in, in the book, you'll find this. The media elite think they are smarter than you and need to tell you what to think. Now, this, this is not a, a Baptist preacher making this up as we go along. This is what this book tells you very clearly by an independent journalist himself. He said, the media elite think they're smarter than you. That's why they have a mission to inform you that you're wrong, that your Christian values uh, need to be locked up inside your church and your home and not shared with anybody else. Uh, they surveyed the media and found that journalists as a whole were well left of the public on abortion, homosexuality, affirmative action, <clears throat> energy policy, and so forth. And in 2002, a study of 116 newspapers found that the media operate with a very narrow range, and this again, I'll show you in a minute this, the source of this, operate with a very narrow range of liberal beliefs, omitted reasonable conservative voices intentionally. In other words, if there's a voice like your pastor who's reasonable, uh, the media says, well, we don't want to quote him because he sounds too reasonable, and we'll actually cut him off as soon as they figure out he's got good sense, you know. Yeah, they'll, they'll say, oh, well, he's not a bumbling, fumbling little, uh, uh, you know, one of these dumb Christians they, they think we are. That we're... So uh, they, they really do tailor the news. Uh, they highlighted radical conservatives. And they omitted radical liberal voices. Again, I'm not making this up. Uh, this is a, an independent study. In fact, let's, let's look at this. Um, I think I, I skipped one here. Let me see if I can get back to it. There you go. Um, the George Mason University Center for Media and Public Affairs. Well, my uh, PowerPoint is jumping ahead of me. I'm not sure what I'm doing here that's uh, <clears throat> getting me off base, but we'll try again. They looked at 585 network news stories between August and September of 2008, which was election cycle, and, and the the facts are very clear that there's a bias there. 65% of the stories were positive toward Barack Obama. 36 in the media were positive toward John McCain. <clears throat> and, and if you were to take that same survey in specific newspapers, the numbers would be much farther apart. This is just overall the entire media industry. So uh, we need to ask, have the modern media technology and culture eroded our ability to think? Someone raised that question because God's called us uh, to serve him and not just to be robots. We're not puppets. We're to take the word of God. We're to let it transform our lives and it becomes a new life and a testimony of what Christ does. And we're able to process that and uh, do that without someone telling us what to believe. We don't have to have a government agency or a media or someone in a university environment come to us and say, well, you have to believe this if you're going to have good sense anymore in America or if you're going to fit in America. And by the way, you know, we know too that our university system is overwhelmed with uh, uh, the left view on everything. But let's be quick to say there are some strong Bible-believing people both in media and in the university environments. And thank God for them because they are so few and far between, but there are many of them that are, are friends of mine. It's a challenge. But we need to be able to think deeply about the complex issues of life, uh, and especially so that we can come to the conclusion of a Christian worldview in what we do. The media has the power to manipulate and to confuse. There's no doubt about it, whether it's print media or... Um, media through social media, through the television, through radio, all of those can be used to manipulate and confuse, but they can also be used to direct truth. And so what you're talking about this week in this series of services is what can we do? So what can we do? 
with, with the confusion, with the concerns, with the issues that we face in the world today, uh, what is it that we're going to be able to do with all of this? I wish I had time to read a, a story uh, about a couple of uh, pastors from uh, New England in the 1600s or from Virginia in the 1700s. Because it was in those days before we had the founding of this nation with the Constitution that we have, before we had all of these things, it was tough in this country. In fact, in, in 1700 to 1760, there were more Baptist preachers in the prison. The records show there were more Baptist prison, uh, preachers in the prisons of Virginia than street criminals because the Church of England said you don't have liberty and if you uh, baptize um, a teenager who's come to Christ or an adult you can't do that the Church of England says no and if you preach on certain doctrines you you know you go to prison so we had in England New England and in Virginia a lot of preachers who stood strong passionately for truth the truth of God's word, but then in 1776, because those preachers stood strong, the men who gathered to write the Constitution of the United States took that into consideration and said, we need to protect these people who are standing for truth and religious liberty. Now we've got a Constitution that gives us that freedom, but it's being eroded and it's being challenged, and a lot of it is just right there in our face in media and uh, education systems and in challenges all around us. And if we say, I don't want to hear about this, then we're guilty of being a part of that crowd who says, you don't need to know the truth. But we say the truth sets you free. And that's what this church is all about, preaching the truth. I, I want to challenge you. Uh, with some truth from God's word for the, a few minutes. Uh, what can we do? Well, we can stand for truth and not just against sin. We're here to stand for truth. We're not here to just say, oh, well, let's put down all of those sinners. Let's just, no, we're here to stand for truth. But let me be clear about something. As believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we stand on truth, not ideas. Our forefathers and the early apostles did not die for ideas. They were not imprisoned and suffered persecution for ideas. They stood for truth. And we're not, to, we're not here today to simply stand for religious freedom, but for the truth of religious freedom. We're not talking about standing for free speech because it's a good idea. Oh, it helps people, yes, I like it, good idea. No, we stand for free speech because it is truth. We stand for the truth of free speech, not just free speech. Uh, we don't stand just for the value of human life. Now, they're like, yeah, yeah, human life, yeah, that's valuable. I'm one of them, and I'm valuable, so yeah. No, it's not just the idea of standing for human life. But we stand for the truth that every human life is valuable because God said so. His word records that. His word teaches that from beginning to end. It illustrates that from beginning to end. And we stand on truth. So we're not here just to take on issues. We're here to present truth. That's what our calling is as a, as a church. That's what our calling is in the ministry of the biblical recorder. And if we're going to do that, we have to be the kind of people who are going to be faithful to the finish. In other words, we've got a race to run, and we need to cross the finish line. Our problem is there are too many quitters in this world. We have a world filled with quitters. Men and women are quitting on their marriage, just walking out, quitting, quitting on their children. Uh, more and more, our Baptist children's homes, you, you just would be amazed to hear some of the stories, and maybe you have heard some of them, but... We try to tell them of, of children who are just abandoned. Parents don't want them or can't, uh, quitting on their children. We have people quitting on marriage, quitting on children, quitting on church, quitting on God, quitting on the United States. Do you know how you can tell somebody quit on the United States? They don't bother to vote. They don't bother to find out who's running, what are the issues, and vote. They've quit. 
And then we've got a lot of people quitting on life. The suicide rate just continues to just multiply over and over. Life's not worth it, they say, so they're quitting. We're just far too many quitters. And what we need is people who will stand firm and move ahead to cross the finish line. And, and there is a finish line so that we finish well and that in the end, the testimony is not that I'm a great guy and so I finished well, but the testimony is this guy couldn't have done that in human strength. It must be the power of God. And they'll look and see, yeah, look how Christ changed his life and everything from there was different and that God gave him the power and the strength to stand. If you read the story of persecution and... Uh, in uh, one of the issues recently, I told the story of just last month at this time. In fact, on this day last month, I was leaving Dachau, Germany, concentration camp. There were 20,000 concentration camps in Germany, and Dachau was the model for them. And I walked through this thing, and it was depressing. But to see what started that, a big part of it was the media was part of the government, and the government said, don't tell what's going on in Dachau. So the media actually told good stories about how in Dachau, basically, this is not the terms they use, but they're planting gardens in there and flowers and having a wonderful time in Dachau. But it was a horrible concentration camp. And by the tens of thousands, people were starving, being beaten and, and shot and, and dying day and night. It, it, we don't want to go there. We want to be people who finish well. And so I want to... I want to show you a, a scripture verse that will help us do this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, this verse says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, that's an important verse. It would be good for you to memorize that verse, but you'll notice that the numbered verse is 58. That is the last verse of a chapter of 57 verses before it. And by the way, verse 57 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't skip that one. But if you go back earlier into that chapter, you'll find that the chapter begins with a verse that says this. It says, moreover, brethren, first verse. We're not going to go through all of it, but I want to show you something. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached, which you also received in which you stand. So he starts out in verse 1 saying, this is about the gospel. And folks, that's what we're about, the gospel. That's why I said it's truth that we're here to communicate, not ideas, not political thoughts and visions, but truth. So then he skip into verse 3 and 4. He says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And here it is, that Christ, and this is the summary, by the way, of the, the message that we live by day and night. And the message of the church is simply this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. We're sinners and Christ died for us. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the message. And then he takes off in the next few verses saying, let me tell you about this rose the third day kind of thing. He said he appeared to these and to these and to these, and he gives you the stories of several to whom Christ appeared to confirm the resurrection's reality. Then he goes into, for the next dozens of verses, the fullest, most complete discussion of the meaning of the resurrection that we have in all the Word of God. He talks about how that applies to us and how that if there's no resurrection, there's no hope. But because of the resurrection, we have hope. And that's why he ends up in verse 57 saying, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, and that's why he starts verse 58 with the word therefore, because he has gone over all of the, of the truth of the power of the resurrection the power of the risen Christ. We're not here to talk about a dead Jesus. We're here to experience a living Christ and to proclaim a living Christ who is the only one who conquered man's greatest enemy, death. And that's why he says, therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There are three things he tells us to be, and I want you to hit those real quickly with me. Number one, be steadfast. I like that word. I like that word because I've noticed that in the scripture, 
it's very important to cross the finish line. Starting in the book of Genesis, sometimes do a word study about the word finish in the Bible. It's in Genesis, in the creation, verse uh, uh, chapter, or rather uh, day seven, let's just say that, day seven of creation. The Bible says, and God finished his work. If you study the uh, creation of the temple, the building of the temple, it talks about finishing, finishing, finishing all through the Bible to where the Bible says Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. And how on the cross, his last words were, it is finished. I've crossed the finish line. This is what it's all about. And he stresses that over and over and over. Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, I've fought a good fight. I have finished the race and I've kept the faith. And that's what we're to do. There's so much about that. But this word steadfast is talking about that. Here's what the word means. It means standing firm in the faith. I've done some serious study on what, um, both what views of commentators and what the text says about this. And there is no doubt that this word, when he says steadfast, it simply means resolutely firm and unwavering. And by the way, that doesn't mean hard-headed. There's a difference, okay? Anybody can be hard-headed. I mean, you, you've had that child that wouldn't eat, you know, eat this, mm, 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 you know, eat it. I remember when our son, and he'd kill me for telling this, but he didn't like cherries, and he had a, a, a cherry, something on a, a cherry at a McDonald's one time. He kept it in his mouth for three hours because he wasn't going to swallow that cherry. He didn't want it. I mean, hey, haven't we all been that hard-headed? That's not what this text is about, being hard-headed. Actually, it's about being passionately, resolutely firm in your convictions, unwavering. Uh, unwavering. You're not going to adjust to the winds of the culture. Just because the media says it doesn't mean you have to believe it. Find out the facts. Be steadfast. But the second thing he says that we need to be in that scripture text is we need to be immovable. Now, that's an important word, too. This word has to do with standing firm in time of persecution. Here's what the word means. It means you are standing in a certain position. Now, you have two options for removing yourself from this position. Number one, your will, your volition, your choice, you decide, I'm moving. But number two is somebody pushes you off of that. Either the winds push you off, the winds of culture, or someone pushes you themselves, and that's how you would remove yourself from that position. That's what this is talking about here, is saying stand firm. The text literally could be translated stand firm, as the text in Luke was that your pastor read a while ago. It's talking about don't let things push you off of your convictions, off of the, the passion of who you are and of what Christ has made you to be. Don't change that. Be immovable. But then he gives a third thing that we need to be. And all of these are important. It's not a cafeteria list, well, I'll be that one, but not that one. This is three things. Again, a summary, verse 58, of what the resurrection means when applied to our lives is this. Be steadfast. Be immovable. But I love this word, be abounding. He says always abounding. Some translations will translate that excelling. Excellent choice. Excelling. Doing more than is expected. Overflowing, some translations say it. It's going beyond what's expected. Here's the idea. Jesus actually illustrated this for us. Do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, said uh, to, in chapter 5 of Matthew, he said, uh, let me tell you how to handle a situation that was in their culture in their day. Christians were really persecuted by the Roman soldiers, by Rome. And the Roman soldiers were a picture of Rome. By law, a soldier could come up to you and say, Rit Bariel, Take my backpack, carry it. And by law, you'd have to carry it one mile. That's all. The law said carry it one mile. Jesus said when a soldier comes up to you and you say, I don't like Rome, 
I'm not going to carry that backpack. Actually, there's no compromise of morality and no compromise of conviction in this case. So he said, here's what you do. You pick up that backpack and you say to that soldier, yes, sir, I'm a military supporter and I'll carry your backpack. And you carry it one mile. At the end of that mile, the soldier looks at you and gruffly says, put it down. You've fulfilled your legal responsibility. I'll find somebody else to carry it from here. You say to that soldier, no, sir, I will be glad. I will be honored to carry your backpack another mile. He looks at you and says, have you lost your mind? The law says one mile. That's all. Yes, sir. But my Lord Jesus Christ says I am to do more than is expected. I'm to be an excelling, abounding kind of person. And I will gladly carry this one more mile. What do you think that does for that soldier? It makes an impact there where he says something has changed that man's heart. I'd like to know what that is. I need it. It's the impact. And in fact, when I sat down with Dan Cathy several years ago and talked with him about Chick-fil-A, one of the chief things I took away from that story in, in him, what he said, he said, Chick-fil-A operates by that second mile principle in everything we do. We aim to do more than any customer expects. And if we can't do that, then we've not fulfilled our biblical or our business responsibility. I like that. Abounding, not just standing firm, hard-headed, but abounding, going with a servant's heart beyond. And then he closes saying three things to be, but one thing to know. He said, there's something you need to know. He said, you need to know that your labor is not in vain. The word vain means pointless, useless. Your labor is not in vain. Now, we need to back up a little bit and put something in perspective. Because in verse 3, the word work or labor is used. Uh, I'm sorry, not verse 3, but in point 3, the previous statement. He, he used the statement there. He said, be abounding in the work of the Lord. That word is a different Greek word from the next phrase that we just started looking at. This word when he says abounding in the work of the Lord, that word is a work that is defined in the Greek as a vocational assignment. It has to do with your giftedness, with your skills, with what you have trained for, what you vocationally do. So he says abound in what you do. That's a good thing. Whatever you do, you're skilled to do it. Don't just do it enough to get by to where the boss says, okay, you did it. Do more than the boss expects. Have this attitude in you that you're abounding in the assignment. But then here he says, knowing that your work, your labor is not in vain. Totally different Greek word for labor here. This is a word that means hard labor. Toil, difficult, challenging. And some of our work is like that. Maybe it's, you know, I've taught that Sunday school class for 25 years, and I'm wondering, has it done any good? I've done this serving here or serving there. I wonder sometimes, has it really made a difference? He said, yes. Staying on target, being a steadfast, immovable, abounding person does not go pointless. It does not end up in vain. God will use it mightily, mightily. If we had time, I could tell you stories about how he has done that in my life, and I've learned the experience of that. But the best story is the one that you experience when you abound in the work of the Lord. I'll close with this scripture text from Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, a challenge. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. Same kind of challenge. Don't get tired in doing the right thing. For in due season you shall reap. If you do not, lose heart means quit. If you don't quit, say, well, it's just pointless. No, no, there's a purpose. There's a reason. And God is actually using it for his glory. I want to challenge you this morning that you open your heart over these next few days and let God speak to you about how important it is that we finish the race, that we stay on assignment, that we stand firm, and that we do so 
with an abounding passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not for my political philosophy, but for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we stand for his truth. I'd like for all of us just to stand to our feet and bow our heads, close our eyes. I want to lead us in a moment of prayer. And as we come to this prayer, the Holy Spirit has been saying something to you in this time. And whatever it is, you'll need to respond to that. After I pray, your pastor will take it from here. And let's just obey the Lord. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word and for the privilege we've had this morning to talk about how important, how valuable that is. And I pray that you would take these seeds that have been sown and um, put them in fertile, the fertile soil of every heart here and that it would grow and produce much fruit and that you would bless this series of services this week. I pray that the people of this church will respond aboundingly and that they will be blessed aboundingly as they see the power of following the truth of your word and standing strong in these challenging days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Alan, for sharing that message with us. So relevant, so timely for us. And, uh, and I ask that as we have this time of invitation that you respond to the Holy Spirit as you're led and that you would consider it particularly lifting up in prayer, you, you know, your own stand. Where is God calling you to take a stand? You know, and, and we often say with our church motto, the first place we go on mission for the Lord is where? At our dinner table, right. Is God calling you to take a stand at home? You know, if you need to come forward and pray about that one, that's the biggest one. That's the one you need to lift up to the Lord. Maybe you've become part of taking a stand in the larger community. It's your workplace. Uh, maybe you, you've been a part of this effort that we have here in Shelby where we want to take a stand for prayer with our school system. And that's one that we're going to continue to work on with the best of our effort and not grow weary while doing good. Amen? Maybe it's a stand for our state because you, you're not going to change a state if you can't change a community. And believe me, you're not going to change a nation if you can't change a community or a state. But pray. Pray for your home. Pray for our community. Pray for our state. Pray for our nation as we sing together the one thing that can change it, and that is Christ alone. Amen? Let's, let's sing together.
Amen. Praise the Lord for that song. Mm. And, and that is what we're going to continue to do. Stand firm in the power of Jesus Christ. Well, the Sadler family is coming up. Uh, minus one that's back there in the nursery right now. Little Jack is back there. But um, they're coming forward to join and unite with us in fellowship. We've got Matt and Heather, Mom and Dad, and Sam. How about raising your hands there? Of course, easy to pick up Mom and Dad. But Sam, Will, Olive. All right, what do you think, buddy? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. Remy's in the back. So, Jack, sorry about that, buddy. Remy's the little one in the back. And, uh, and we are delighted to have this family come forward. Uh, talking to him the other day, talking to Matt, he said something that I thought was neat. I said, now, is everybody baptized? You know, is it, oh, yeah, yeah. And he said, and, um, you know, pretty, pretty soon uh, Jack will be baptized. And um, I said, okay. And, and, and he said, we're probably going to be planning on that. And, and the way he was talking, he said, you know, and I thought, well, gosh, I didn't, we hadn't announced a baptism. Because I was just thinking that he was thinking that he would be baptized here. But he went on and he said, you know, because we baptize all of our kids as a family with our family at the river. How, how cool is that? Here's a dad that is, is leading his family, you know, it, spiritually and saying, no, I, I want to baptize every one of my kids. And I want to be an example of godliness for them. And I thought, that's an awesome thing. And I've heard about how over at Putnam, you know, Brian Gleason, the pastor from there, and that's a wonderful congregation. That's what they actually do with their kids. When a, when a child comes to faith, the dad or, or the mom is actually the one. Brian will be talking about baptism and the significance of it, but that mom or dad will do the baptism. And I thought, you know what? You, you got me thinking. Maybe that's something we need to do as well because I'm just so proud of you and the stand that you have as a family with that to lead in, in, in faith and in the spirit. So I would ask that uh, one of our members make a motion to act on their request for all of them, except for Jack, and of course, like I said, Remy's in the back there at the nursery, all of them to come and become members of Elizabeth by their profession of faith and their baptism. They've already been baptized and, uh, and also a second to that request as well. All right, heard uh, many motions in many seconds. All in favor, respond with aye. aye. Any opposed, like sign, as I thought. And it's wonderful to have been worshiping with you, get to know you guys. And yeah, on that note, Keith, you can just do a, you know, that'd be good. So, <laughs> um, great to have you guys with us. We look forward to growing together in the Lord for years to come. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the Saddlers if they...